Welcome back to another episode of Why It Failed. Today we're going to be looking at a game that helped define the generation of the early 2000s, with incredibly high highs and pathetically low lows. Yeah, today's episode definitely is involving a game that's hard to even call a game. Oh jeez, just play the intro already, I don't even want to think about today's episode. In the mid-90s, skateboarding culture was certainly starting to take off. Sika tried to capitalize on this with a game called Top Skater that released in the arcades in 1997. Just a year later, Electronic Arts would also make their own skateboarding game as well called Street Skater in 1998. Activision recognized that skateboarding simulation games were starting to grow popular amongst the younger audience. But before Neversoft, there was actually another company working on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater beforehand, although not much is really known about them other than the fact that they had failed to impress Activision. Enter Neversoft. The studio that was currently working on a game featuring Bruce Willis, where he had to blow up a bunch of bad guys in a game called Apocalypse. Neversoft was on the brink of closure at the time, and a mid-sized Activision at the time would work with Neversoft to retrofit one of their failed projects into a new version of Apocalypse. This new version was also used as a testing ground for a brand new ambitious skateboarding game. Enter John McClane's Pro Skater. So yeah, the first ever playable character was actually Bruce Willis. During the development of the game, a lot of the people working at Neversoft would spend their lunch breaks at a nearby bowling alley. Here, they would spend time playing and studying Sega's Top Skater skateboarding game, a game directed by the crazy taxi creator Kenji Kano. Both Top Skater and Observing Skaters at that year's X Games both served as strong influences in the way that the gameplay turned out, and instead of using things like real-world skate parks, they opted in to create their own unique areas like schools or cities and intersections, and added a bunch of ramps and rails to those to make it more fun over realism. Of course, the dev team realized they couldn't use Bruce Willis forever, so they opted in to get a professional skateboarder to help aid with the remainder of the game's development. Enter Tony Hawk. Probably the most famous skateboarder of all time, even back then. It didn't take long for them to not only get in contact with Tony Hawk, but then to also fly him out and show him gameplay in which he was also impressed, and in January 14th of 1999, they had announced his inclusion as being a part of the game. Activision Senior Vice President Mitch Lasky in an interview with GameSpot stated that the character was meant to reflect Tony's signature style, an intense mix of acrobatics and hardcore technical skating. Throughout the development, Tony Hawk would not only be responsible for giving feedback and playing other builds of the game, but he would actually be responsible for which professional skaters actually made it in. Finally, the game came out on September 29th of 1999 and sold over 3.5 million copies worldwide. So by the end of the first game, you could definitely tell that Pro Skater 1 was a powerhouse name and was spreading throughout households worldwide. So how did we go from the success of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1? to the absolute failure that is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. While there are actually quite a few bad sequels that came out before Pro Skater 5, Oh god, please don't get me started. Pro Skater 5 is easily the worst. But believe it or not, Pro Skater 5 is not the fifth installment in the series, it's actually the tenth installment. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 was developed in collaboration between Robomodo and Disruptive Games. Pro Skater 5 was essentially a last-ditch effort cash grab created solely because of the fact that Pro Skater was not only a legendary name within the franchise, but also because Tony Hawk's license was actually going to run out with them at the end of 2015, so the game was completely rushed through development. So why not Neversoft? Well, in 2008, Robomoto was tasked with producing new Tony Hawk games after the original developer Neversoft went to go to Guitar Hero.
Ah uh, yes, a different time period in the world where Activision had more than just Call of Duty. This resulted in Robomoto creating two peripheral related games for Tony Hawk called Tony Hawk's Ride in 2009 and Tony Hawk Shred in 2010. Both of them did absolutely garbage. <laughs> They also worked on Pro Skater HD, which was essentially supposed to be a remake of all three of the first games all put into one game. Believe it or not, it was also trash. But then suddenly, in November of 2014, Tony Hawk announced that there was a new entry coming to the Pro Skater series, and later at E3 2015 doing an interview with GameSpot. Yeah, the online stuff has been uh, involved in other uh, Tony Hawk games. I remember there was PlayStation exclusives for some of the online stuff, and Xbox fans wanted to get online so much it actually hacked it uh, into their oh, system. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's System Link. Um, has that always been a sort of a push for you guys? Because Tony Hawk is such a... It's almost like a competitive type game. I remember playing with my buddies and I'd have a go on Warehouse and then be yeah, like, all right, you uh, try Well, that's do always it. been an element. It was definitely multiplayer, but, but the multiplayer that we were more used to was with same two people on the same console with a split mm -hmm. screen. And it, we obviously had online play in the past, but, but it just wasn't, it hadn't come of age like it has now. So the fact that we can utilize that and, I mean, we can, we can offer the game digitally, we can offer downloadable content, like yeah. all those elements were not in part of the THPS uh, series originally. Uh, let's look at some of the gameplay here. You guys debuted this, I know, on Jeff Keighley's stage uh, for a U2B3. Uh, some familiar looking places here. Yeah, well, we got the, the, some of the old Ferris school and the warehouse, um, a little bit of the hangar in there, and uh, we have new elements too where you can you know, get electrocute your board or mm. set it on fire and, and actually bla literally blaze a trail behind yeah. you. Meanwhile, at Robomoto, let's just say the game was being very hastily developed. Many of fans who saw gameplay later that year were... Uh, disappointed to say the least and at least how the game looked graphically and... Yeah, you can't really blame them. Two months before the game release, they switched to a cel-shaded art style instead. Activision, on the other hand, tried to pretend that this wasn't feedback that caused them to change the art style and was solely just so the game could have consistent frame rate. Fun fact, there are four ports of the game. First, you had the Xbox and PS4 versions being made by Robomoto and Disruptive Games, where Robomoto focused on the main game and Disruptive Games focused on the multiplayer. Meanwhile, Romanian studio Fun Labs was working on the PS3 and Xbox 360 versions and those versions definitely didn't run at a consistent frame rate. So what are some of the things that Disruptive Games did? Well, they worked on Diablo 2 Resurrected, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 Plus 2, Godfall, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, and Oryx Must Die. Of course, a lot of the development problems that happened with them is hardly their fault. As I said before, all they did was work on the multiplayer. So that fateful day comes around. September 29th, 2015. And it would be putting it lightly to say that all of the reviews were unfavorable. It got a 39 out of 100 on Xbox One, 32 out of 100 on PS4 from Metacritic, 5 out of 10 from Destructoid, 2 out of 10 from Edge, 3.5 out of 10 from Electronic Gaming Monthly, Eurogamer avoided it, Game Informer gave it a 6.5, Gaming Revolution gave it a 2 out of 5, GameSpot gave it a 3 out of 10, Games Radar gave it a 2, a one and a half out of 5. Giant Bomb gave it a 1 out of 5. IGN, IG fucking in, gave it a 3.5 out of 10. Official Xbox Magazine gave it a 1.5 out of 5. And Metro gave it a 2 out of 10. Yikes. So, what exactly happened? Well, let's just say that the game was so rushed to release that it was unplayable without an 8GB day one patch. With only the tutorial and the part creator being accessible, essentially, the patch contained the entire game. Which means nowadays, if you get a physical copy of the game, I'm pretty sure that means that you can't even play it. After this absolute disaster, it was named the worst video game of 2015 by Entertainment Weekly. And Polygon named Tony Hawk Pro Skaters 5 one of the worst games of 2015, writing that it was so broken, so garish, and so grim, that the reformed Tony Hawk lovers rue the day that they laid eyes on the franchise. A bit dramatic, but honestly, with how awful that it came out, it's deserving. And we haven't even talked about the plethora of bugs throughout the game. Please cue the bug footage. Ah, 
after all this, only 11 months after the release of the game, Robomoto did tragically go out of business. But in all fairness, I mean, making a game like Tony Hawk's Ride, Tony Hawk's Shred, and then Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, I mean... Yeah, they weren't exactly booming. And yeah, tragically, Disruptive Games? No, no, actually, Disruptive Games is doing quite well for themselves. Like I said, they worked on Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. That game's kick-ass. Like, if you haven't played that game and you're a Castlevania fan, I don't know what you're doing at this video. Go play Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. That game's amazing. So, at least it's not totally tragic by the end of this tale. One company made it out unscathed, while the other one got completely brutalized. And that's this week's episode of Why It Failed. Uh, honestly, I was expecting this episode to be a bit longer, like... Almost double the length of last week's, but after putting all my research together and starting to talk about everything, I realized it wasn't really going to be as long as I thought. Um, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater is a game that I used to play as a kid, and honestly I bet a lot of you watching this too. I absolutely love the third game especially, but the fifth game, I stayed away from it as far as I could. I didn't play it when it came out, and I still refuse to play it. I mean, you can play it through emulator probably on like RPCS3 or something now, but I wouldn't recommend it. Anyway, thanks for watching this week's episode of Why It Failed. See you next time.